So this morning, we're going to look at Psalms 19, and um, you can refer to your sheet, and then we're going to have communion afterwards. So um, this is a Psalm of David, and this is a Psalm that, uh, well, it's, it's a situation here that you're going to see some foundations put in. And how that works is, let's just take a quick look at the structure of the psalm, and then we'll get into the exposition of it and why it's important. Um, first of all, the first uh, six verses are going to talk about the design of nature, the display for the case of God, uh, the law of God, verses 7 through 11. It gives revelation about God, the application, how does this all work, 12 through 13. And then at a prayer at the end for uh, God's help. Now, we're going we're gonna to actually kind of wonder what is a definition of nature. Because when you use that term, a lot of people think of all sorts of things from like going to the zoo or, or an animal or something like that. But what we're going to actually look at is the fact that created nature, which is what we live in. We didn't evolve and this whole thing just wasn't a cosmic accident. It was actually a creation by the hand of God. And with that in mind, what you want to see is the fact that there was a purpose for creation and how creation came into being. So let's take a look at a couple definitions here. And nature exists not for a merely natural, but for a moral end. Not for what it is, but for what it says or declares. Let me read that to you again and think about this for a minute. Nature exists not for a, mere, a merely natural, okay? In other words, it wasn't something that just happened, but for a moral end. So there is a design in creation and in nature, this moral end, and, and, and what it declares. What does nature declare? This is called natural theology and just by looking at nature you can see the complexity of the na of, of nature and you can see the fact that that the way everything fits together and how the laws of physics and chemistry and and biology and everything else how they are complex and how they just couldn't have happened by chance so we go on and we take a look nature declares that God is just and good this has been called into question. Nature says that every natural law, if obeyed, tends to, tends to happiness. Nature's laws are benevolent. Men have not fully appreciated this for one reason, because they have so commonly broken these laws and have suffered. So if you follow the basic course of how everything is designed, you'll get an idea of how this all has come together. Now let, let me just ask a question here. How many of you have actually tried to put something together without instructions? <laughs> right? And, and basically you're in a situation like, yeah, I, kn I know how this all works. And you don't read the instructions. What, what, what takes place when you do that thing? It won't go together right. It won't go together right. Why? Because it was designed to go together a certain way. And, and the same is true when it comes to what? When it comes to what we're talking about uh, this morning. So let's take a look at another part of this. God looks upon nature as a basic language. Let the heavenly orbs be for signs. So, and, and what that means is that the way the solar system works, the way the stars work, okay? Signs are vehicles of ideas. Let them say something. Let them be words. The universe is God's telephone, God's grand signal, service system by which he can flash messages from the heights above the depths, valleys below. The material system is God's great instrument for conversion. Now, now, when we say this, and people look and they see how creation is together, or they look at the sun, the, the um, the sunset, and they go, oh man, that is gorgeous. There's got to be a God. What, what takes place is this design that God has created, and the complexity of creation cannot happen just by chance. Okay? There's what's called the fine-tuned universe. 
Do you realize that if just one aspect of the universe has changed, just even temperatures a slight degree, that everything we know and how it exists would change like that? There is a basic stability in the creation. And God is revealed in creation. Let's take a look, first of all, at Romans 1. Take your Bibles with me to Romans 1, verse, uh, verses 8 through 32. Romans 1, verses 8 through 32. And if you're following around in your, um, in your um, study Bible, we're looking at um, page... Anybody got it? Who's got it? 2,158 in your ESV study Bible. 18 through 32. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking, and foolish in their, uh, fool, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And if you, go, if you go down a little bit, and it gives us a, a, a description of what's happening. So what's going on is God's signature is in the creation. And he is showing himself through creation. And let's take a look at John 1.5. Anybody know what John 1.5 is? Or John 1.1? In, in the beginning. Yes, in the beginning, God did what? Create. create the heavens and the earth. And everything that was made was part, he was in part with it. Christ made that. Um, let's go to Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1, verse 15. Swing on over there. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, in him hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that everything might be preeminent. In him, all the fullness of the God of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So let's let's go back to um, Psalm 19. Now we're going to tear apart this this first paragraph. So four parts, four paragraphs. A paragraph, the first sentence of each paragraph tells what the idea is. The rest of it explains that. To the choir master of Psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pour forth out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through the, all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and a strong man runs its course with joy. It's rising from the end of the heavens and the, its circuit to the ends of them. There is nothing hidden from its heat. What is he describing here? Has anybody got an idea of what he's describing with this? The what? The rising of the sun. And the what? The setting of the sun, from the rising of the sun to its going down. Yeah, the, the, the demonstration of how everything has been put together. God is showing himself through creation. 
But this creation that he's showing himself with is limited. It can lead a person to believe that there is a God, but it cannot lead a person to salvation. You can put together the shower without the instructions, and what happens to the shower? It doesn't work. Okay, why? Because it isn't according to its designed purpose. And so what creation is all about is basically two things. One, it runs on various laws. Two, it demonstrates that there was somebody who created it. This is called intelligent design. And intelligent design people will tell you that they're not necessarily pointing to God, but they're saying, all of this just can't happen. There has to be an intelligent force behind that. And of course, like what we're seeing here in the scripture, what it's saying is basically, who is that designer? This can't just happen. Somebody had to be there. And that somebody who was there, and that somebody who put together creation is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Cool? <coughs> now, because we're in a situation that we don't know how or what the instructions are, there are instructions. Now, now, how many of you realize that if you do certain things, you'll get certain reactions? Like, why are we all being able to sit or walk on the ground? What keeps us from not just floating out into the oblivion? Gravity. gravity. All right? There is a law of gravity. All right? How many of you feel that you can change the law of gravity? I mean, how many of you would be willing to even try to repeal the law of gravity? Okay. How many of you would be willing to go on the roof and jump off and saying, I'm just going to float? <laughs> you would. <laughs> All right. These are laws that are built into the creation. Okay. And if you challenge those laws, what begins to take place is very simple. The law acts even though you don't want it to work. So the law of gravity will not be changed. And here we are, and everything is in its place. But God has laws. Alright? And let's take a look at what that is. The law of God gives revelation. Okay? And we're going to read this a little bit, and then we're going to get into... Uh, the breakdown. But the law is basically found in three parts. There is the civil law, which is the law of a nation. There's the ceremonial law. Does anybody know what the ceremonial law is? When you read your Bible? The what? The ceremonial law. Does anybody know what the ceremonial part of the law is? The tabernacle and the priesthood. Okay, now who fulfilled the priesthood of the law? Jesus. Jesus. His death on the cross, guys, nullified the law that you find where you're supposed to slaughter bulls and goats and all this other stuff that's in there. So the civil law of Israel is not the civil law that we have here in the United States. The ceremonial law is no longer in effect because the the things of the ceremonial law are now, what? They're now fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Yeah. But the moral law is still in effect. And you can see this in um, Romans 7. Let's turn to Romans 7 for a minute. Romans 7, 7. It's going to be one of those mornings that either you are a Bible whiz at moving everything around and finding where it's at, or you wish you had an index edition. Yes. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if I had not been, not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet the, uh, the law, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. 
Now, what is going on here? The law defines what is sin and what is not. Now, how does this work? Okay, it works like this. There is a place in Germany where you could drive as fast as you want. All right. Some of us, some of us have been over there and have seen this. You can. You can drive at 120 miles an hour or more if your car is capable of that. Why can you do that? Does anybody know? No speed limit. No speed limit. No speed limit. Seriously, there are parts in Germany that have absolutely no speed limit. But here in the United States, what do we have that would prohibit you from driving 120? Cops. What was that? <laughs> speed limit. Cops. 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 Why can cops do something? Is the speed limit? The little laws, right? So where the law is, it defines what you can do and not do. You all there? Uh -huh. All right. How do we know what sin is? Where is one place that you can find what 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 a list of sins are? Yeah, in the Bible, does anybody know one in particular? There's usually about ten of them that are referred to. No, yeah, Exodus. Yeah, yeah. See, see what, what happens is that the law, let's take a look at this over here for a minute. The law is still in, a for, in, in force. What we just saw is that the law defines sin, and under the moral law there's judgment. And if you turn to Romans 2, 12 through 16, you're going to see all of that coming in. Because he's talking about the situation. Of, matter of fact, we can flip over there because we're close. Um, Romans 2, 12 through 16. Okay? What page number is it, kids? 2,116. All right. Here we go. Romans 2, 12. And at Romans 2, 12, it says, For all have sinned. Well, how do we know uh, how, that all have sinned? For all have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous but uh, righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So here's the thing. Whether you believe in the law or not, the law stands. Alright? If you're driving in a 50 mile an hour zone and you don't believe it's 50 miles an hour and you do 120 does that make it that you can do the 120 no even if you get caught you're still what oh even if you don't get caught all right you're still doing what you're breaking the law all right and and you're in a situation that what is going on is in creation there is divine law If you follow the law, you will prosper. Now, what I mean by following the law is that we're not giving you just a list of rules, okay? But we're giving you guidelines, like the lights on a runway when a plane is coming in at night, how to actually live. What are the boundaries of life? Did you want us to speak something? No, just th th think for a minute. I want you to think. <laughs> If you obey the laws of God, the basic laws of God, you will prosper. If you disobey the basic laws of God, you will not only come under judgment, but your life will become more difficult. Marriage is an institution that is what? It's established in creation. We see this in the, in, in, in the first and second chapters of Genesis. God said, this is the way for a family to be established. When you go outside of the boundaries, and I'll be pretty right on uh, blunt here, when you enter into a sexual relationship outside of marriage and produce a child, that brings about all sorts of ramifications in your life, does it not? So God's design for how we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do is for the benefit of your life. These are the boundaries. These are the reasons why. This is how you flourish. 
You follow what God has designed marriage to be rather than breaking that type of covenant by substituting it with something else. Let's take a look at 1 John 5.10. 1 John 5.10. 1 John is... Um, <coughs> excuse me. 1 John 1, 5, 10. Chapter 1, 5 through 10. Now you might be right now in a situation of wondering what is going on with this. I want to dive into this for a little bit. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And what else is it saying there, guys? And what? The blood. The blood what? What does the blood do? Take a look. Read what it says there. This is very important. Because we're not just talking about coming under judgment. We're talking about a lifestyle that will produce in you and for you prosperity. And I don't mean necessarily financial prosperity. Let's read verse 7 again and then and, and, and follow with me. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And what? What does it say? Come on, guys, follow along. And the blood of who? Jesus, his son, does what? Cleanses us from some sin? All. All. All right? All sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive, our, deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Here's the key deal. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive. Forgive our sins and to what? Cleanse us from what? All. All what? Unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, what is very important about this is what the situation is with how these words break down. Okay? And so let's go back to um, Psalms again, where we're looking at things here this morning. Psalm 19, verse 12 through 13. Uh, who here has not sinned? Anybody? Any takers on that one? No. Let's take a look at some of these words and, and, and break this down a little bit, okay? Um, so we're going to look at, actually, um, I'm, I'm becoming a little bit ahead of myself here. I took a quantum leap. Let's take a look and just read the portion of 7 through, through 11. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Perfect. Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is? Sure. sure. Making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is? Pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are? True. true and the righteous altogether. More to be desired than and than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the drippings from the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In the in keeping them there is great reward. Why is there great reward? Because your life will prosper with it. Now, when it's talking about the gold, what does gold have to do with being in a passage like this when it's talking about purity? Does anybody know where you find gold? And don't tell me the jewelry store. How did it get there? Where, where do you look for gold? Alaska. You know, well, yeah, where do they find it in Alaska? Uh, rivers. Rivers. Underground. Right? Underground. Underground. So when you find the ore, it's got what? Is it pure gold when you find it? No. no. It's got to be refined over and over 
and over again till you get to the point of having that 99.99999%. In other words, it has to be heated up, it has to be melted. Then they skim off all the garbage, then they heat it up again and melt it, and they skim off all the garbage, and they heat it up again and do what? They basically do that seven times before the gold becomes pure. And when it's pure gold, all of the dirt and garbage has been removed from it. And it's 100% pure gold. When we talk about the honey here, if you notice, sweeter also than honey and the drippings from the comb. How do you get honey any other way except from what? Bees. bees. Right? The bees produce honey, and then that honey is made from the, the plant... Uh, nectar that's around, but how can you have honey sweeter than a honeycomb? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Well, they used dates, and they squished and, 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 and refined the dates that it became a liquid-type sugar. So there's a process in both the gold and the honey to purify it. The law is a process to help purify your life. Now, how many of you have ever gone to the doctor and you go, you know, there's something wrong with me and I don't <coughs> understand. What does the doctor do in order to tell you what's going on? They Google it. They Google it. <laughs> <laughs> they probably do nowadays. But... But what, when they do a diagnosis, what they're looking at is the principles of your body and how they're put together. Your, your biochemistry, your bones, the density, all of this stuff has particular ranges and laws that, that allow the body to function properly. So when we call about or talk about a disease, what do we mean by disease? We mean that there is something that is not what? normal. And that produces a law or a rule that the physician looks at in order to determine if you are healthy or not. Okay? So let's take a look a little bit at the next portion. The next portion of what we're going to look at is application, which is 12 through 13. Now that we know that there is law, now that we know that there is law built into creation that is moral law that will lead us and guide us either to have a good life or not, how do we apply that? And this is where I think the mind-blowing begins because the wording in here is a little bit precise about how our life is all about and how we think and act, okay? So let's read 12 through uh, 13. Who can discern his errors? How many of you have ever been in a situation where you've done something and you don't understand why something happened? And somebody comes up to you and goes, well, you know, the reason why this happened is because of this, that, and the other thing. How many of you have used a lawnmower? Right? And you pull the cord on the lawnmower, and the lawnmower is going, and then all of a sudden it stops. Okay? And you're there wondering what's happening, okay? And, and you're, you're there and you're pulling the cord on the lawnmower and nothing is happening. What's one of the first things you want to check for? Gas. Gas, yeah, there you go. So you discern, well, maybe there's no gas. Well, so what else could happen that when you pull it, if there's gas in there, what's, what's going on? What's another thing you got to think about or discern? Maybe you flooded it. Maybe you flooded it, okay. Maybe What's too much gas. Maybe too much gas. What else would you find out if there's gas in there? And uh, you didn't prime it. You didn't prime it. Okay, that's another thing. What else can you find out? Oil. <laughs> right. See if there's anything obstructing it. How about there's one other thing that you could look for, and it's got a little thing that you turn and you dip in and then you pull out. Yeah. All right. If there's no oil. In the lawnmower, it's not going to start. start or work. And that's called basically discerning. You tr who can discern? Look at this. 
Who can discern his or her errors? Well, if we don't know what sin is, we don't know what the law is, we don't know if we've sinned or not, right? And usually the Holy Spirit will give you something saying that what action you just took place or are thinking about is wrong. Amen. Okay? Who can discern his errors? Well, how do we know how you can discern his errors? Because we have the law that defines what the sin is. Declare me innocent from hidden faults. See, now, Psalms do this. They say something, then they repeat it again with different words. And this is entering into an actual prayer, like he's saying here, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent, because what's happening is once you understand the law, you understand how you stand in the law. The law defines what sin is, and it brings us to Christ, Paul says. It's the schoolmaster that brings us to be able to look at ourself and our life, to discern where we are, where we are really at. And, and then once you have that discernment, the thing is that it brings you to the point of repentance back to the cross, back to the blood, back to the covering of your sin by the blood of Christ. Okay. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Now let's take a look at some of the, de the definitions of some of these terms, okay? When it says reflect or behavior, that is your discernment. When it's talking about your secret sins and declaring the innocent, look at this. Presumption, okay, is actually here behavior. <coughs> Audacious or arrogant behavior to which one does not have a right. In other words, you are doing something that you know that you shouldn't be doing. Dominion. That's a word that's being tossed around a lot today. To exercise authority over us as nations or other entities, even natural ones like animals. Okay, Do not let them have dominion over me. Don't allow the sin to rule my life. To be blameless, to become pure without blame or free of guilt. How many of you feel that that is something that in your life, if you're carrying guilt, that you want to be free of? Yes. Blameless, to equip, acquit rather, to pronounce not guilty of criminal charges. Transgressions, the violation or the transgression of law or duty of moral principle. What is this basically saying in a nutshell? It's basically telling us in a nutshell this, that once you come into the understanding that you have sinned, and the guilt that has brought you to that point, or the realization that has brought you to that point, that when you ask for forgiveness, you are what? Forgive. Forgiven. 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 So why are you hanging on to guilt and shame and everything when it has been removed? Hello? Maybe a little bit of disbelief. You know, here's the thing. A lot of us, when I, when I was pledging for a fraternity, and some of you have heard this story, we had what we call, pardon the expression, Hell Week. And it was the last week of pledging. And, and your pledge boss, who was there to make sure that you didn't die in the process, would, would oversee what you're doing or what is being done to you. And so uh, here I am. I'm in my final week of, of, of pledging for the fraternity. And this guy puts these leg blades on me, one on each foot. And we're supposed to go on a 20-mile hike. And I can barely lift my feet. I'm weighed down. Okay? I'm weighed down. And sin weighs us down. And then my pledge boss, thank God, came and said, you're not going to survive with those weights on you. And so he removed the weight. In the same light, when we sin, when we have guilt, when we continue to hang on to that guilt... It's like weights that hold us down. And when Christ has set you free, you are free indeed. And so if you're living your life to the point that you have guilt and shame and all sorts of baggage, leave the baggage behind and move on. Particularly when you've confessed it and he has released it. 
Now, if we look at the book of Romans, the book of Romans is a courtroom setting. And the best way I can describe this is you break the law. You go down the road and you are driving faster than the speed limit. The policeman comes and declares that you have sin. He writes you a ticket. You go to court. When you go to court, what happens is the sin, the, court, the, the, the transgression, the ticket is paid for, right? If you go back to that court a week or two later, and you walk into the courtroom and you say, Judge, I'm the one who was speeding the other day. The ticket and everything, it's all documented. And the judge looks at you and goes, you paid that fine. Oh, but judge, I was the one who broke the law. But you paid the fine. And you say, but judge, I broke the law. And he says, the fine is paid for. Get out of my courtroom. Why? Because that sin, that transgression, is no longer in effect. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood of Christ. Thank God for the fact that when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 14. This is where the prayer comes in. Are, are you all grasping what I'm telling you this morning? Because this is freedom. Matter of fact, we left out the last portion there of 13 where it says then I, sh I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression when you come to Christ and you confess your sin you are totally innocent you are totally forgiven your sin is totally removed and you are spotless clean refined as gold and silver let's look at the prayer let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, the words in James 3 are referring to our speech. 3.1. Just keep your finger in Psalms there and go to James for, me, uh, for a minute here. Okay? How many of you realize or have said things that you wish you never said before. All right, it kind of just slips out, right? James 3, 1. Not many of you have <laughs> should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a strict, uh, greater strictness, where we may stumble. All right, so he's talking about the fact that speech and teaching have an effect, okay? If anyone, uh, let's move down a little bit here, where it says, um, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. Verse 3, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at ships also. Though they are so large, they are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great things. Okay? How great is a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, straining the whole body, setting the fire of the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Verse 7. For every beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human, verse 8, we, no human, hmm, no human being can, uh, being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord our Father. Oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, all right? And with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. The power of what you say has a lot to do with how people are going to react to that. The words of my mouth, the heart, the internal, the meditations of the heart. And we look again at Exodus 2017, the 10th commandment. And, and, and just turn quick to Proverbs 20. 
verse okay. nine. All right, you guys, who, who, who's got it? What page is it on? Proverbs, 9. Proverbs 20, verse nine. Thank you, brother. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. 1,168. 69. Who can say I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. And, and the, the situation is, in this prayer, what he's getting at, okay? Let my words, of the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Hey, guys, what do you think about it? Mm. You see, it's not, it's not, it's not what you say only, it's what you think. <coughs> What's your thought life like? What are some of the things you think about? What are some of the things when you think about that you want to actually do, but you, you can say to yourself, well, I didn't really commit a sin because I thought about this, but I didn't do it. No, 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 no. The thought life has a lot to do with where you're at when you come into the throne room of God. Matter of fact, for some, it may even be a blockage to enter into the fullness of being in the throne room of God, of having intimacy of God. And Isaiah talks about this, you know, hey, we want to come in, but your life is like with filthy rags, and he says, confess and I'll remove that. You see, it's not, being a Christian is not a situation of having this thing to be a rule book. It's a guidebook. And being a guidebook, it tells you, first of all, what errors you've committed, but second of all, what to do with those things. First of all, how to live your life. Second of all, the empowerment of how to live it. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Can you let Jesus into your thought life? Can you let Jesus into your TikTok watching? Hello? Yeah. Oh, it's only an app. Oh, it's, a, it's an education that they're trying to make you think differently. Got awful quiet, awful quick. Clean it up. How many of you have ever walked in a house? Bless you, brother. How many of you have ever walked in a house where it stank? Yeah. Right? And you walk in the house, come into my house. And you walk in and you go, hey. Okay? When Jesus walks into your, into your heart, which is his house, does he smell things that shouldn't be there? Sure. <laughs> I'm asking, I'm being very serious because this is, listen, if you guys want to get closer to God, if you guys want to have the power of God, if you guys want to be able to speak God in power and in grace, you need to follow the Lord, you need to follow his leading, you need to be in a situation where your heart is pure and clean. Not making excuses for, yeah, I looked at it on the phone and, well, that was something else. But actually, what are you taking into your spirit? What are you taking into your life? Because each of those things become a hook. You know, how many of you, how many of you are attached to this crazy thing? To the point that when you get a notification, you got to look at it. Or you got to find out what the, the newest thing is or what the newest act is, or what the newest news is. This thing is trying to teach you something different than what this thing is trying to teach you. You all there? How about, how about the one-eyed cyclops that most of us have in our living room? That thing over there called the television. What stuff are you ingesting with that? How does that affect your thought life? Because where sin begins is in the thought life. Have you ever understood that when you're being tempted, it's starting up here? And then when it's starting up here, it is either calling you into action or not. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord. Now when we use that term, Lord, what do we mean? The Lord is boss. 
he, you have sold out your life to the boss. Okay? Is he Lord or not? If he's Lord, he's your rock. We, we lived in a house in New York for a while. That The house was beautiful and everything. And they're showing us the house and they bring us down into the basement. And in the basement, two-thirds of the basement, is a rock. And I'm like, well, what's that doing there? Well, we can't move it. So we poured the basement around it. You mean that I have a rock in my basement, in this house that I'm renting, that there. just stuck there, exactly. Can't move. can't move, right. And when it's using this expression, oh Lord, oh boss, my rock that cannot be moved, and my redeemer. Now what's a redeemer? How many of you drink pop, commonly called soda in God's country, all right? And you, you buy the, 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 the soda, the pop, and you have to buy the container as well as the contents. And then when you take that empty can or bottle and you take it to Myers or Wally World or wherever you bought it from, you give them the can and they give you what? Money. Money. Ching ching. Ching ching, right. And depending on how much you've drank, it might be big change, all right? But the situation is that that store is buying back your can. And when we talk about redemption, what is that? We were created in God's image. Our forefather, Adam, has fallen. We have sinned. Somebody had to pay the price to bring us back into relationship with God. We needed a Redeemer, and His name is Jesus. That too. You all understand what's going on here? Because what's happening here is, is the fact that there is a guide for life that will prosper you or it will bring you into judgment and you have a choice where to live. There is a guide for how you are to think and what you're to think about. And these are boundaries to make you prosperous. Just like when mom says, don't touch the stove, She's not saying that for you to, you know, to, because she's a party pooper. She's saying that because you don't want to get burned. And in the same situation with what we have in this song, God doesn't want you to get burnt. He wants you to prosper. So we're going to have communion. So um, we're the, um, go grab the elements there. So we're going to have communion, and while we're distributing communion, um, I want you to think about what we're talking about. Paul warns us not to take communion without an opportunity for looking at <clears throat> and examining our lives. So what we're going to do is we're going to enter into a time period now where what I'm going to ask you is, to really seriously ask God to examine your life. Examine your, your stance with the Lord. And you at home that are watching, go grab, um, go grab some juice and crackers and join us as well. So let's go, let's search our hearts before God and see where we stand with Him. This morning. Guys, this is serious stuff. It's not, we're not joking around right now. Buttercup, stop. Go lay down.
everybody receive the, uh, the elements? Let's look to the Lord. Received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he, uh, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This matzah has been crushed and has been shaped and pierced. You can see the holes in it just like Jesus was pierced. And so what we're doing is celebrating the covenant that we have with the Lord. So the eating of the bread is the symbol of his broken body. So let us participate in the eating of the bread. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And what's interesting about the cup is it symbolizes the blood that covers your sin and mine. And the cost of the cup was the death of of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the perfect and only sacrifice for sin. So as we participate in the drinking of the cup, let us remember the cost in our relationship with him. And let us, before even drinking the cup right now, if there's anything that you need to confess to him, take a moment and do that before you drink. Because this is a symbol of the covenant that you and I have. So let's take a moment just to examine ourselves one more time. We thank you, Lord, for the blood that cleanses us from each and every sin and brings us into relationship with you. In Jesus' name. Let us drink the cup together. Father, heal your people, Lord. Allow them, Father, to come into the fullness and joy of having relationship with you and with one another. For, Lord, the cross is not just up and down, but it's side by side as well. Father, strengthen our body of believers. Lord, let us live godly lives for you, so that we may give you the honor and glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.